All set. All right, thank you. So good morning and welcome to a special AARP Coffee and Conversation. I'm your host, Linda Hodgson, a volunteer with AARP New Hampshire. Co-hosting with me this morning is Alan Cohen, also an AARP volunteer. Please note that we are recording today's session. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. In an effort to eliminate the background noise, please be sure to mute your line by ensuring that your microphone icon has a line through it. And if you're not sure what that is, if you touch the lower left-hand corner of your screen, um, that will appear and then you can um, touch the microphone. We'd love to hear from you this morning though. So if you would like to ask a question, please use the chat box, which can be accessed by clicking the chat button. Our fellow volunteer, Mary Roberge, will be monitoring the chat and raising your questions throughout the program. AARP has been promoting the health and well being of older Americans for over 60 years. Here in New Hampshire, AARP staff and volunteers work together to help make our communities friendly, livable places to work, play, and explore for everyone, and work closely with community stakeholders to make our communities even better places to live. Joining our conversation this morning is Jer Jerry Ann Bogus, Executive Director of the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. Welcome, Jerry Ann. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much, Linda, for having me and thank you all for being here this morning to learn maybe a little bit about New Hampshire's Black history. My name is Jerry Ann Bogus and I'm the Executive Director for the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. I live in Milford, New Hampshire, and I've been here 38 years, <laughs> trying to remember one. I'm originally from Jamaica and came to school here and have lived here since. So I think it bring a, a little different perspective in looking at our history and this really desire um, to raise awareness of a, of a history, a little known history in our state that is often ignored, forgotten, erased. Um, Cause I didn't know anything about this history until some years ago after I'd been living here for, in Milford especially for over 20 years. So I'm happy to share what with you. And I really would love for this to be a conversation so that we can talk more than kind of a lecture feel. Thanks. I'm not sure. I thought somebody was going to be asking some questions. Uh, that's me. I didn't okay. know if uh, anyone was going to say. And now over to you, Alan. So okay. I, will it, I will say it myself. Now over, over to, me, to you, Alan. Alan. <laughs> so before, before we get in, Jerry, and I, I, I just want to congratulate you for receiving the Owner Judge Award for Human Rights presented by the Human Rights Society. And uh, Owner Judge is certainly a name that's familiar to us uh, on, on the seacoast. Anyway, I did want to uh, ask you, uh, New Hampshire has an, an African heritage that dates back almost to the arrival of Europeans in the mid 1600s. Can you share uh, with us a bit more about this rich and very often neglected history? So yes, thank you, Alan. Um, uh, African-American Black history has been in, in our country, in our region, way before European contact. Um, we don't have solid documentation for the traders that came from the West Coast of Africa before enslavement. But the first known Black person that we have recorded in P Portsmouth history was in 1645. Um, he was a if you've been to the African burying ground in Portsmouth, you'll see the monument at the entrance of the African burying ground. And that um, the male figure represents this man. We really don't know his name, but we know about him because in 1645, there was a court case where um, the, the, um, the people who um, enslaved him from Africa brought him to what was Massachusetts and a man, Mr. Williams bought him, uh, a man from Portsmouth and Mr. Williams bought him and brought him to Portsmouth. But the case went to court because 
the um, enslavers, the slave traders who brought him to the country did so on a Sabbath, on a Sunday. And it was illegal to do work on a Sunday. And so that's how we have that recording of this man being in Portsmouth in 1645. It is really ironic that what brought him to our attention was not that he was part of a group of Africans that were enslaved or the slave trade, but that the enslavers did this work on a Sunday, you know? So I thought that that's basically the first story that we have, not first story, but the first recorded anecdotal story that we have. Great, thank, thank you. And for all of you who have never been to the uh, seacoast, the African uh, burial ground is a 6,500 square foot public cemetery. It's a public cemetery that's full. It's a, it's a beautiful spot and I would encourage any of you who find yourselves in the Portsmouth area to, uh, to stop by. I understand that there were both guided and, and also self-guided tours offered by the Black Heritage Trail in multiple New Hampshire communities. Would you tell us a bit more about these and where we can find more information about them? Absolutely. So um, our tours, because Portsmouth was the original port for, um, for enslavement, where the story starts of enslavement in our country, our, and because Portsmouth had the largest black population back in the 17, 1600s, we have multiple sites in Portsmouth. And it is of course where we're headquartered. So we offer these um, private tours, guided tours and self-guided tours from Memorial Day through um, the first week in November if it's not too cold because it's their walking tours. And they're basically themed tours where um, we've organi organized these sites. In Portsmouth, there are 22 sites and some are closer, some are you know short enough for walking distance, but we've organized them around different themes. Sometimes they change from year to year, but they're really, really pretty solid. Um, uh, uh, one of the themes is a thirst for freedom, where we look at the civil rights from um, the story of enslavement to the civil rights movement. Um, the another one is um, a tour of the black women. So ain't she a woman? Let me tell you her story. So historic black women from the 1600s to the 20th century. We have um, living history tour. Uh, which an uh, actor, Kevin, that you know, Alan, um, presents, and it's Meet Jack Staines, a Black Jack. And the Black Jack was the term used for Black sailors back in the 17, 1800s. It was definitely one of the jobs that was available to Black men at that time, slaved, enslaved, or free. We also talk, do a tours on the owner judge story, for those of you who may not know that story, Ona Judd was um, enslaved to George and Martha Washington. She escapes the Washington mansion in Philadelphia, comes to Portsmouth. Um, she never becomes free, but she's never, um, George Washington tries to recapture her on um, multiple occasion, but is not successful. Her story is told in a book, never caught but she lives in, ended up living in Portsmouth and um, in Greenland, New Hampshire. So we tell her story on the, um, on the guided tours as well. So that's just an idea. We also have tours in Milford, Hancock, Warner, Exeter, and Greenland. Those are not as many as we do in Portsmouth. Those are mine. Sure. We expanded to Milford offering five tours for this season, which is the most we've done yet. Fantastic. But one of the exciting things I'll have to um, tell you, Alan, is that we're starting to put markers up across the state now at some of these historical sites. In 
September, we'll unveil a marker in Hancock for the Dew family. In October, we're doing um, one in Warner. And in November, we're doing one in Milford for this year. That's, that's great. Thank you, Jerry Ann. Mary, do we have any questions from any of our, uh, our viewers and listeners? Um, yes, we do, Alan. Um, Jerry Ann, how did you first begin to hear about Black history in New Hampshire? Good morning. Sorry, my grandson just walked in. <laughs> um, so back in 2002, in um, Black History Month, a reporter in Milford wrote an article about Harriet Wilson um, being a long forgotten daughter of the state. And that was my first time I'd seen any historical reference to a Black person living in the state in the 1800s. She publishes her book in 1859 and she was born and raised in Milford. Now, Wilson was the first Black woman to publish a novel in English. And reading that article, I was just really surprised that as somebody who had accomplished something so huge, something to be honored, praised, lauded, I had never seen or heard of her at all. Her name was never mentioned in the school, never mentioned in you know, her book that she published. So she was completely erased from this history. And that's basically how I got started in this. The article that said that um, the, the high school, the interviewer interviewed the high school principal and he said he was gonna do, um, do everything he could to get it in the school. He interviewed, she interviewed the head librarian and he said he didn't know the genre and so he didn't publish it, but the next week after that article came, a teacher from Milford High School said that Wilson's book was inappropriate for high school students. And that's what really got me going in that, you know, I read the book, I thought it was just an, for a teacher to say that was just another way of erasing the history. So I formed a group, we created the Harriet Wilson Project, we built the monument and we just went around trying to raise awareness for her. And then I met Valerie Cunningham, who was doing all this work in Portsmouth and got involved with the work that she was doing there and um, uncovering all these other histories across the state. Oh, thank you. So um, there is a question about any other cities, uh, are there other cities other than Portsmouth um, that are connected with Black history? And I believe you mentioned that with some of the markers that you're gonna be establishing throughout the state? Absolutely, there are, in, in one of the articles that I read, there is no town in New Hampshire that did not have black history. Um, we're, I, I will preface that back because the town lines were different back then, but in no county were there no history. Um, in Andover, we have the story of Richard Potter, the first um, uh, well-known black magician. Um, Coit Mountain is the story of Van Coit where there was a, um, a community of former, formerly enslaved men who were Revolutionary War veter veterans living there. And all across the state, there are these rich, rich stories um, of black history. And um, some, some of them are, are the first in our nation. You know, Wentworth Cheswell in um, New Market was the first black person to be elected to public office, you know, for a state that does the first, um, every four years, first primary. We also have the first man elected to public office. So yes, they're across the state. They're, right now, the trail is working on 18 towns that have documented history that we're um, planning to do markers in. And every time we go out, we get another call um, of other black history. Wyndham, somebody from Wyndham just called us and they want to put a marker up on what they found as an, a, a burial ground like Portsmouth. 
well documented in Wyndham. So yes. Are, is there a list of where all these markers are and, and the people that you have mentioned? Um, we're just starting to put markers up across the state. So like I said, the ones I mentioned are the first, we, we're planning for four to five this year. Um, uh, Hancock, which represent, talks about the Dew family, um, founding families of Hancock actually, um, Warner, Milford, um, I forget all of them. And oh, Wyndham wants a, a marker up this year. But yeah, on our website, if you go on our website, Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, we did a, a series of stories for the Episcopal Church over two years for their Lenten program. So there are 80 stories of um, African Americans, early African Americans in our state, across the state, what they did and what their accomplishments. So these stories are on our website under our programs and Lenten Project. And that's blackheritagetrailnh.org. Thank you. Um, so I've got a couple of more questions. Um, one is any work being done to get uh, black history classes uh, taught in New Hampshire high schools? Well, that's one of those touchy questions. Um, there are some really dedicated teachers across the state that are um, dedicated to raising awareness and teaching their students these um, stories. But if you all know, we just passed a law, New Hampshire State Bill, um, new, I think it's two, it was 544, which didn't pass the Senate, but it, then it was attached to the budget, which um, has put a real chilling effect on teachers teaching um, divisive concepts in their classrooms. So um, that's where we're going to be going is still left to be told. Another question is, do you know in what year the last enslaved person in New Hampshire gained their freedom? That I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, one of the 1842 census, I'm really bad at dates, so don't hold me on this. But the last enslaved person that we had on a census was in Hollis, New Hampshire, around 1840, 42, and they maybe 40 because they do them every 10 years or so. But um, if they gain their, if she gained her freedom, I don't know. She just, that's the last recorded person that we have enslaved on a census. Now you must understand, New Hampshire never um, abolished slavery. Um, it was the 13th amendment that ends slavery in New Hampshire. We were what you were called a gradual emancipation state where um, the enslavers would gradually um, release their um, servants, their enslaved folks. So keeping that record and knowing exactly when that happened is not easy in our state. Oh, I'm sure it isn't. And one other question can private Black heritage trolley tours be arranged? Absolutely. We do private tours and we can do a trolley tours. We usually work with um, two trolley organizations and we do bus tours. So if you're particular to a trolley, that's interesting because that's owned by somebody else. So we'll have to work through that. But we've done bus tours across um, in, in different towns um, where we rent a bus and do tours, yes. Well, we have a few more questions that have, have, have come up in the chat. Um, one of them is, were um, the enslaved people, persons mainly men or women? I don't know if you have that. So when, um, when America started um, bringing captured Africans to the Americas, through the Caribbean, 
their first group of enslaved people were mainly children. Um, so then as slavery was being abolished in Europe and the trade um, tightened here, it was important for them to bring women. Well, men, <laughs> that's a hard one. So men were brought, you know, to do the work. They were seasoned in the Caribbean to do the hard work and then brought to the Americas. But women became popular because we were unique in doing a breeding our enslaved people. So numbers, I can't tell you, but that's kind of the trajectory children, men, women. Thank you. And um, we recently had um, book club conversation with Michael Cameron Ward, uh, who told us a little bit about his family history. Uh, and someone wants to know if there's any connection between his family and uh, your organization. Not that I know of. Okay, thank you. Thank I you. Don't know. Okay, and my last question is, do you know the percentage of the New Hampshire population um, that is black? Um, New Hampshire's population um, of African-Americans and blacks are different. So I think we're at 2% African-American, 4% um, black people of color um, currently. Uh, in different towns, Manchester and Nashua, um, where our largest population of people co of color are, we see um, at some places a 6% of the population in those towns. Um, Durham, during the time when college campuses are on, and we see Portsmouth at the time in the 1800s, there had the largest population of um, Blacks and also when we had Pisa Air Force there, largest population of Blacks in our state, but we really fluctuate between two to 4% in our state. Well, thank you. We, I, I, the, the chat is just really uh, alive with, with questions. Um, Alan, I'm sure you have a few more questions and I can continue on a little bit later. Sure, that, that's great. Jeremy, and you talked a lot about the uh, the, the tours and some of the other things. You want to talk about some of the other programming that uh, we all can participate in and get involved with? Absolutely. So the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, um, our real goal, uh, as we say in our mission, is really to raise awareness of New Hampshire's Black history in order to build more inclusive communities. And in doing that, it is important for us to create programs where we um, have dialogue. Um, our first set of uh, programs we usually run in February through March, six, six Sundays from February to the second week in March, are what we call tea talks. Um, and uh, they're around, uh, based on community subjects, current issues. Um, this season, we were on Zoom for that, as everybody else is on Zoom for everything. Um, but we saw our, our attendance go from, we used to be in the library at Portsmouth for 200 people to 500 people for these talks. And just to give you an example, the series that we had this year was Blacks in White Spaces. So for the six conversations, we looked at, um, at uh, tra uh, traditional places where Blacks are not expected to be. So we looked at farm, farming in New, New England, uh, uh, science fiction writers, uh, uh, blacks at predominantly white institutions and so on. So that's on our website. We, um, in June, we do a Juneteenth celebration, which is celebrating black life in New, in New England and all of our programs have an educational component, but our Juneteenth one is really our celebratory event. We had um, a concert that we partnered with, with the music hall. Um, we have drumming at the African burying ground to honor the ancestors and then dialogue. Then we do a community, we host 
a community read on July 3rd of Frederick Douglass's um, famous speech about the 4th of July. And that is hosted at noon. And this year we had 14 different towns across the state join with us in that community read. Uh, then we have the Black New England Conference coming up in October. Um, again, this we go beyond New Hampshire's stories and look at our nation or critical issues. Um, the Black New England Conference this year, the theme is Crossing River Jordan, um, a spiritual way of healing through accountability and truth telling. So that's the theme for this year. And I'm not sure, I think that's all of it. And the tours, there are five major programs that we offer per, per year. Are you associated with other, other groups that have interest in, in, uh, in African-American and uh, 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 I'm sorry, in, um, in black issues generally, such as Black Lives Matter? So we do, we do talks and do partner on events, but remember we're a nonprofit organization in New Hampshire, so we can't do any soliciting and politicking around for our chapter, but we do, we can do educational programs, talks and dialogues, but no protest and stuff. But yes, we, um, we bring, we had um, in one of our June, uh, our tea talks, we had members from the different um, Black Lives Matter organizations coming together to give a, you know, to participate in dialogue and talk. And that's what we do, bring people together around dialogue. Great. Mary, are there any additional questions from our audience? Okay. Uh, there is one. Um, this uh, participant wants to know how we can help you do more across the state. So we have a very, very vibrant opportunities for, um, for volunteers across the state. One, you can donate to the trail. You know, it's always helpful for work, um, help with research, bring to light stories that we may not know. Um, we've got a committee that is our research committee. We're pulling together um, the research across the state. People are calling us all the time. So if you're into research, solid research, you know, that can be helpful. Um, if you, tour guides, as we expand statewide, if you're interested in leading a tour, we do train our tour guides. Um, we, we, our tour guides, there's an organization, the National Association for Interpreters, where our tour guides are certified through this organization so that we're you know, um, have a format for how we do our programs. We're also, if there are teachers that you know were in schools that you want to connect us to, that's also helpful because we're looking for younger. We have a series called On the Trail where um, our high school, middle school students um, share the history in their, Black history in their area on these little three minute videos that we're putting on TikTok, on our social media. So um, yeah, we have a volunteer coordinator. If you're interested in other ways that you can help, um, just let me know and we'll definitely get you connected. And I saw that question was from Julie. Hi, Julie. Hello. You're doing, you're doing such great things. And I think opening up dialogue is just, just Absolutely. the right thing. Uh, definitely hosting a program in your area for around our tea talks is really interesting because that's, I think for me, that's how we create change is through dialogue, how we have people engaged in these conversations that we really don't have and understanding each other. So that uh, our tea talks are really uh, to me, one way of bridging the divide and getting to understand people at a much deeper level and understanding our history, because that history informs us where we are today. How did we get to here? And hearing that and knowing that creates these bridges that we can then build upon. 
Great. Um, Betty wants to know if you are connected to the African American Cultural Center in Portsmouth. Absolutely. We um, partner with them on various events. Um, they have a, a museum space that we will share their events and they'll share ours, so yes. And she also wants to know if you can tell us something about um, the library in Portsmouth, about your library in Portsmouth. Yeah. So um, I was trying to think of how many books we have and I don't have that number, but um, we have a, a, a very extensive library. Um, it's not a Linden library, it's a research library that people can come and use of books pertaining to the region's black history um, and um, our nation's cultural history. So it's really called, really focused on our region. That's great. And let's see here. Um, are you able, Sarah wants to know if you're able to do any outreach. Um, she runs a senior center in Pelham and um, she would like to have some of these stories brought um, you know, to the, her members and the participants. Absolutely. So we do, um, we're developing a speakers bureau with the trail, but we're, uh, we're already here and able to go out and we do these talks all over the, everywhere actually. Um, but we're developing a speakers bureau specifically around our, you know, about the issues that the trail brings to the so again, um, for any speaker's um, uh, invitation or for anybody from the trail to come and talk for a tour, we can just call our offices or email us. Great. And let's see, I have um, Kathy who wants to know if the Black Heritage Trail is connected to the multicultural team in uh, City Hall and other towns? No, not, um, I have not worked with um, the, that group in Manchester. We're connected to Southern New Hampshire University in Manchester. Mm -hmm. um, we do our Black New England Conference at their location. Um, we, <laughs> um, <laughs> Julie knows this. Our office is one and a half person. So, and then we have a series of volunteers. We've got about 30, 40 volunteers that help us do our work. Um, as we grow, um, we'll have more connections, but right now we're connected with historical sites in different locations, um, some colleges and universities and independent social justice organizations. Um, is who we've deliberately partnered with so far in the different towns that we're in. But it doesn't mean that we're not looking to create other partners. That's basically how we're structured is to really create partnership with other organizations um, to, to raise awareness, to promote the stories that we're doing and create spaces for dialogue around this black history or contested history. Great, thank you, Jerry Ann. Um, sure. And right now, there are not any more questions in the chat. Jerry Ann, I've got one more question for you. Just the name, the Heritage Trail, almost implies that somehow in New Hampshire we may have been part of the Underground Railroad. I know that at least in the Seacoast, there is no conclusive evidence that says that we were. A, do you have any any uh, information about potential black uh, the uh, underground railroad in other parts of New Hampshire? There, there's definitely lots of anecdotal stories of New Hampshire being of sites in New Hampshire being part of this secret network to um, that helped um, enslaved people leave the South and go to Canada and also to other places. Um, there's anecdotal evidence in Portsmouth of a couple houses that we've looked at. Um, the spring, I don't know if you went to the spring, the site for the Springs home in Portsmouth. 
Um, This is one of those questions that I, I don't like to re, retell old narratives, um, but for us to think about what the Underground Railroad really was, it was really a network of people and not, a, not this every cellar hole, every house that had a cellar hole was part of the network. Um, but there is a professor that's helping us to look at what these networks are. The family in Portsmouth that I'm thinking about this spring, their um, probate records, there was just a husband and wife that lived in the house. He was, um, they were bakers. They met the ships, the, all the ships that came into port. They knew the schedule in their, in their records, in their probate records, they had multiple trunks of clothes of varying sizes and um, and you know and sh shapes for men and women, they had tons of eating utensils and and was that you know this may be one of the safe houses for um, uh, self emancipated um, enslaved people. Um, in Lee, New Hampshire is the only documented house that we have so far that's part of the network, the, the um, National Network of Underground um, Railroad Houses. And they, we are looking at different sites. In Milford, there are three houses where we have documented you know, um, safe spaces. In Andover, we have somebody just brought up a house that we're looking at. Um, that also have documentation. So we're trying to get these on the national register, but again, that's a lot. That's it's a rigorous process um, to document those as safe houses under the Underground Railroad. Great. That's kind of a roundabout answer. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I know it was a, it's a sort of a difficult question because there's no yeah. documented. Uh, Conclusive yeah. evidence. In, in yeah, and that's the that's the thing that makes telling New England's story and documenting these locations as underground railroad safe houses, because it was a secret network. You know, um, who 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 they were, the safe houses. We can find documentations and maybe people's journals, but it takes time to do all that, to sure. definitively say that this house served as a safe house for um, the enslaved. Great. Well, well, well thank you. Um, thank you to everyone that has uh, participated in, in asking uh, all, the, all the, the, the probing questions that you have had. And uh, Mary, thank you for monitoring all of that. And then I'm going to now turn it over back to Linda. Um, before Linda comes on, I'll just give folks for the number, because um, I never know the number to our office. So if you want to call our office, it's 603-570-8469. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to visit the trail. I've never visited it. And after today's talk, I can't wait. Um, so thank you so much for our audience for joining in as, as Ellen said, for all the great questions and all of the information and the resources. Um, and be sure to check the AARP New Hampshire website often, aarp.org slash NH for more virtual programs coming soon, including live cooking demonstrations, paint and sip events, gentle yoga, and yes, more coffee and conversation. So thank you everyone and have a wonderful day. Before we leave, uh, there is a question from John. He wants to know if we will be able to access this event seeing that it is being recorded to listen again at a later time. Can you answer that, Kelly? Um, yes, we should be able to put it on our blog, um, and we can also share the recording with everyone who registered. Right. Thank so, you. Someone asked if we could repeat the phone number. Uh, it's in the chat, but it's 603-570-8469.
I'll also just add if the AARP wants to organize a private tour for members, um, we're happy to do that. We do private tours and we can um, schedule that at any time that you want to do that. So we're happy to do that. Great. That would be lovely. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Well, thank, thank you so you. much for having me. Thank you, Jerry Ann. Bye now. Bye bye. Thank you. Oh, Mike. Thanks, Jerry Ann, and everyone.